Okay, uh, so it feels like 3.15, so we'll, we'll get started. Um, so I'm Nathan Shepard, I'm here with uh, Ken Field. We're here to talk about 3D cartographic uh, techniques. This is our last session for the UC that we have to present, so excuse any giddiness towards the end. <laughs> so uh, first of all, if you think you're in this tech workshop to learn some stuff, that's true, but we're also here to indoctrinate you in the way of thinking about 3D and 3D maps. So we want you to change the way you think about it, sort of start planning and authoring your 3D content a bit different. So hopefully you'll leave here a bit energized and go, no, I'm not going to make that boring map like that. I'm going to do it this other cool way. And speaking of cool, um, you know, before you even start making a 3D map, you should ask yourself why. Uh, we ask people, why do you make 3D views? And uh, nearly everybody says, because it's cool. And some people say, it's cool, man. Um, <laughs> So, you know, that's kind of nice, but there are actually some real reasons. What they really mean <laughs> when they say that it's cool is that you can see vertically stacked content. So that's the number one thing that 3D does, that 2D doesn't do, is you can see everything that's stacked above itself in one view. So like building floors is a classic example. You need multiple maps to do that, uh, to see all that. But in 3D, you just turn sideways and you see them all. You can also show data in an easy to understand form. So in that sort of that left screenshot there. Uh, we've got like an air corridor in, up in space and then we've got threat domes. People are trying to shoot down the planes. It's kind of like a really hard concept to understand in 2D. Like how would you even map that uh, really well? But in 3D you just draw this kind of like egg-like thing and it, it totally makes sense. You look at it and you understand it. And also um, it you know, invites imagination and understanding. If you look at that you get excited, you, you're sort of drawn into it. And this is how people have been making maps forever. Like the city map, 1487, a city map of roads in Greece was this 3D bird's eye view, just all hand-drawn, artistic. But that's how people wanted to see their cities. Uh, and then the one below, it's even older. It's China, it's actually a really long tapestry and it shows a village along a river. Uh, and this is, how, this is how we see the world. We look around, we see things in 3D, and now we're starting to expect to see all of our content in 3D as well. And it's cool. So, great. Everybody thinks 3D is good. You're here for a reason. Um, what happens when you try to make a 3D map? The first thing that people do is something like this. I, I call these population sticks. Um, you know, so we've got Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool and Leeds uh, with the populations. You can see the actual numbers there. So that's just extrusion. The side of the size of the stick, the height of the stick, tells me how many people live there, where the stick ends up on the ground in terms of where the city is. So that's kind of not bad from this viewpoint. The thing about 3D is that you just move the viewpoint. So now I'm sort of come above and I'm looking straight down on the world and I've got no useful information at all. I can kind of see where the cities are, but I don't know how big they are. I'm kind of losing the point of being in 3D. Or worse, I sort of come down close to the ground. Now I'm looking across and now I've got bad information. Leeds looks bigger than Birmingham, which is obviously not true. Um, so, and all I did was just move around. And you've got no control over that. When you make the scene, you author it, you need to think, what are these users going to do when they get in? They're going to fly around and they're going to go to weird locations and we've got to be careful they don't come up with uh, you know, bad results or bad understanding of the data. So what do you do to, to get around that? Well, there's a few techniques. Uh, a really simple uh, sort of combination is using labels and real world size symbols. So they're no longer sticks, they're now cylinders with a real world size. And just looking at this as a person, you go, okay, Leeds, it's fatter, so it's bigger. And, and Birmingham's off in the distance, so that's why it looks smaller. No one sort of thinks, oh, I'm standing next to a, a little car. Uh, you know, there's a tiny car over there and a giant car here. No, everybody understands perspective. And the idea is you use real world size symbols and you can kind of get away from that problem where the viewpoint gets in the way. Slightly more sort of advanced way of getting around it, if you like, is to use an isometric or axonometric uh, view projection. So when we're looking around, we've kind of got like a 50, 55 degree view angle. There's a, there's a disappearing point. And uh, most architectural drawings, I'll, I'll draw the front and they'll have a disappearing point and everything sort of goes to that. So it looks like a real world thing disappearing off. With an isometric view, you, the computer can render it a different way and say, there is no disappearing point. All my lines are parallel. Uh, and then, so on the left there, it's exactly the same viewpoint as the one above, uh, but the, you know, the isometric view means that 
uh, everything's in exact same size, so the symbols sort of maintain it. So that's a good trick for, for screenshots. When you do that with an interactive view, when you're navigating around, it kind of messes with your brain a little bit because it feels really wrong. So you've got to choose when to, when to go to that method. So I'm going to run through some slides. Uh, I'm going to introduce some words. Hopefully some of them will stick. And then later on, um, actually most of this session is some examples, some live examples of work that Ken and I have done. Uh, and we'll explain why we made the decisions, cartographic decisions on making them. And we'll use words that I'm going to introduce here. So hopefully they'll be, you'll be reminded of them as we go. So a 3D view has, has four main elements. We say the first one is surfaces. So that's that mesh thing on the top. It's kind of like the ground is a, is a really common surface. So most scenes have a, a primary surface where most of the stuff lives. And that's usually the ground. But you can have other surfaces. You can have below surface geometry. You can have um, ozone layer. Or you can have thematic surfaces. You can have population as a surface, or um, housing prices as a surface, or percentage chance of being attacked by a polar bear as a surface. Uh, and that would all work uh, as, a, you know, as an element within the scene. So once you've got your, that mesh, that surface, you can put things on it. We call those things textures. And the most common or famous texture is aerial imagery. So the most common surface is the ground, and the most common uh, texture is an aerial imagery. But they're two different elements, two different data sources. You put them together, and then you start to get some 3D uh, in your view. Then we have features. These are things that live on or relative to the ground. Trees, it's a 3D symbol. It's a feature or building. They live on the ground. Uh, planes go up in the air. So you, need to, uh, you can model those uh, extra things into your view. We'll call them features. They're rendered differently and authored differently. And then last, we have marginalia and effects. So marginalia, north arrows, it's, it is easy to get lost in 3D. You navigate around, you sort of end up looking at the sky or being underground or inside a building. It can be quite annoying. So uh, we want to help users by giving them some extra on-screen controls. Like North arrow is a, a common one uh, to help them get around. Uh, also, in 3D, something that you can do that you can't do in maps is you can add atmospheric effects. So what's the lighting? What time of day is it? Is it in the morning and I've got long shadows, middle of the day with short shadows, no shadows? Is it foggy? Is it rainy? You can do a lot of stuff like that in 3D. So uh, historically, I would say that people thought about scenes in, in two ways. There's photorealistic and cartographic. So photorealistic needs to look like the real world. They're real looking buildings. There's, there's imagery on the ground. Trees look like trees. If you zoom into the tree, you see leaves and bird nests and birds cheeping in the, in the trees. That's kind of it. The, that's what you uh, kind of expect when you're in that world. And 92% of people, just making that number up, but I'm using the same number I used earlier. So at least I'm consistently. Yeah, you remembered that. That was good. Yeah, yeah. consistently <clears throat> making things up, are working on photorealistic. So games movies, GIS people, we're all making photorealistic scenes. I would contend that's a mistake. I think we need to change the way we think about 3D, and we use photorealistic when it makes sense, but not always. Certainly nowhere near 92%, even though that's made up. Uh, on the right, <laughs> uh, we have a cartographic scene, so there's nothing real about that. It's a flat world. We've got extruded heights for polygons. Uh, showing uh, the different relative uh, populations of the different places around the world. So this is actually giving us some information. I can see where more people live, and I can see how much more live in those different locations. So I'm getting a bit more information out of there rather than just what could be a photo if I happen to, to visit that location on the left. So I'm starting to get some more information out. But I actually think the sweet spot is in the middle, um, augmented reality. This is where you've got a mixture of the two. So there we've got realistic buildings, and we've actually got uh, aerial photography. But we have extruded semi-transparent uh, polygons showing police districts. And I've got this, this fire station uh, symbols on sticks showing where all the fire stations are. So again, we're starting to incorporate some real world so people feel familiar and they know where it is, but also some cartographic uh, representation so you can actually get some knowledge out of it. So just a little bit more about photorealistic scenes. If you, if you consider yourself a 3D cartographer or just a cartographer who likes to work in 3D, um, photorealistic scenes are kind of boring. There's, there's, um, there's no design decisions to be made. 
if we open this window and looked out, that's just specification. It should look like that. There's nothing that you can invent. It needs to look like that. If, if the trees look wrong or the buildings look wrong, then you've got to fix them to look like if you're out there in the real world. Um, so why are, they, why are they useful? Well, they're, they're really useful for changes to the status quo. So we've got the perfect world now, and we're going to add one more building to it. So what's it going to look like afterwards? That's a really good reason to use that photorealistic scene. Um, and then you can also add mood effects, lighting and rain and fog. So you can make it rainy if you want to make the place look dark and scary or sunny and bright if you want to advertise Pasadena or something. So this, this image here, I, I like to use this one. Uh, it's a beautiful ray-traced cityscape for Rotterdam. Uh, ray trace means that light is actually fired through it and it bounces off things, bounces off the windows, bounces off the rippling water, makes this really nice effect. Um, but it really only has one use, and that's, that's a new building, so that's a good reason to use this. Otherwise, uh, you should go off and do something else. You should do some cartographic work. So if you like to make 3D maps, cartographic scenes are where the fun is. They're interesting. The design requirements are as rich and as full as making 2D maps. You get to make lots of decisions. Um, you can make them powerful, eye-catching, immersive, that kind of grab people and come in and have a look around. And everything is up for grabs. You don't need to so show things their real size. You can put a giant car in there, or a tiny car, or giant people, or whatever. Nothing needs to be the, the same size that it has to be. You can use shapes, you can offset features, you can use textures, you can add in text floating in the air. All these decisions can be, can be done. So for example, here we've got um, international flight paths. You don't see actual lights, balls of light flying around showing where the flight paths are, but it's a cool and interesting and informative way of sharing information in 3D. Same with the, uh, the one below it, the solar impact. The buildings aren't textured with the, what they actually look like, with their bricks or whatever. They're actually colored by how much solar potential they have. How much, how much sun shines on them in a day. And then sort of down from there, we can see how much shadow that's casting down on that circle down the bottom, that, that, uh, that little park. So we're adding information, useful information, into the view. So continuing with our little word challenge. Um, so types of 3D worlds. There's basically two types, global and local. If you use ArcGIS 10X, um, global would be Arc Globe, local would be Arc Scene. If you use ArcGIS Pro, we have a 3D view and you can flip between global and local viewing mode really easily. Just author it once and it's just a little viewing mode choice. Global is really useful uh, if you've got global extent data and also if curvature of the Earth is important. If you're on top of a mountain and you're looking out, you need to include curvature of the Earth to show really how far you can see. Um, and good for global context, shipping lanes around the world and so on. Local, it's obviously uh, very used for, for small areas, a fish tank area of, of interest, a mine site, a building, or a set of buildings, um, where everything's just in a relative context. And in between, there's kind of like this gray area where you can choose between them. So 3D sounds great, but I, I, I can't continue without warning you that 3D can be evil. You need to be a little bit careful with it. So if you look at that top right pie chart, that blue wedge at the front looks enormous, cool, that must be the thing. Um, but if we looked at that same pie chart from directly above, you would see that it's actually a small piece. It's only 20% of that chart. We've, we've, uh, we've used some perspective distortion. We've moved the camera down and zoomed in really close to something and it's filled the whole screen and it feels like it's super important. So what, I, what that screenshot there is doing, it's lying to you. Or if you did it, you are lying on purpose to someone. So be careful with, the uh, with perspective distortion. The other thing about 3D is content can be hidden. If you want to advertise that this is a great building to buy an apartment in, take a whole bunch of screenshots for it, uh, where you're looking away from the dump or from something else that you don't want, or the giant building that's next to you that's blocking the sun. You can, um, you can do all of that stuff in 3D. You just need to be careful uh, about how you use it. Uh, same with continuous scale. So in 2D, when we're authoring a map, we often think about, I'm going to make a 1 to 10,000 or 1 to 24K uh, map. And it's straight down, and I can author everything so it works really nice together. In 3D, people just tilt the view. You know, these users that make life hard, they tilt the view, and then you end up with something like this, where you've got lots of different scales in the view all at the same time. So you have to author your content to work across many scales at once. 
So it doesn't need to look good at certain scales, but the connection point between those scales needs to match up. So in this screenshot, it's actually a, an example of, of a good use case. So in the front, we've got building footprints, and then as we move further away, we've got points of interest, then just minor roads, and then just major roads left off in the distance. But all the colors match, all the sizes of the symbols match, and it looks quite seamless, even though effectively there's less content off in the distance, a different scale of data is being shown. Some other things about 3D that, that annoy people, um, it's really easy to get disoriented. If you, uh, if you end up facing in the wrong direction, you don't know where you are, um, that's, that's quite annoying to use 3D. Also, uh, large amounts of data are needed to, to do 3D, and it can be slow to load. Uh, and also, they're a little bit harder to author, so it's, it's a little bit scary to go in there and, and sort of have a go. And we're gonna try and get past all of that. So that's the end of the scary. From now on, it's nothing but good news, but you should just tuck that away at the back and go, hang on, am I, you know, is 3D being evil to me? Just sort of remember that. And now we're just gonna talk about all the good stuff. So what does 3D give you? Uh, so the one big thing I would say is familiar symbols. So if we look at the top right there, uh, we've got basically green balls on sticks. But I think everybody realizes they're trees. So green balls on sticks are trees. We all drew them that way when we were younger. You can still draw them that way and people will see them. They don't need to have leaves. They don't need to have branches and bird nests. So, uh, and then, then you can make some additional choices. So in this case, the trees are all green. All those balls are green, but we could make them red or orange or purple to mean something thematic within the view as well. So you get additional uh, benefits from doing that, but people will still know that they're trees. Same with the stylized shapes. The one right next to it, that's actually a land use map, so they're not the actual buildings that are there, but we can see where the park is. We can see the yellow is single family residential, and off in the distance we've got the orange sort of medium density residential, and that red building is an office building. So you don't need to go, okay, yellow, let's go over to the, over to the legend and say, is that the same shade of yellow? Okay, that means that. With 3D you can take advantage of the shapes as well and kind of remove or at least reduce the need uh, for a legend. Uh, and then just the, uh, the other one I'll talk about on this, this slide, uh, bottom, bottom left there. So uh, they're just major roads and they're the size of the, of the wall that's been created from, they're just extruded sort of apart and up. The size of the wall is how big the road is. So on the top left we've got uh, a freeway. So it's hard to walk across a freeway. You're not gonna, as a pedestrian, you're not going to do that. So that's a really big wall. But in between, we've got different size uh, roads that are a bit harder to cross. And what we're trying to portray here is any places that are hard, that have sort of limited walkability. I live here and I have, I'm in a pedestrian island. Like I wanna go for a walk with my dog. Where do I go? I can't, I'm not gonna go across the freeway, so I can't, I can't go that way at all. So we're just looking for ways to, uh, to improve that. And if we put in pedestrian crossings, we could cut holes in the wall and people get an idea of how they would get around so we can sort of communicate some pretty complex information just by using something that's familiar. Walls are hard to get over. Really big walls are really hard to get over. You can also use um, attribute-driven symbols. This is something that's uh, really big in 3D. Uh, so on the left, we've got street light coverage. We've got the position of all of our street lights. We know how strong or how bright each of those are, and we just do a semi-transparent yellow ball that's, uh, that explains, that sort of represents the light coverage from that. And then we can just look down there and we can see, do some visual analytics. We can see where we do have coverage and where we don't have coverage. It's just, so there's no analytics at all. It's just the human looks at it and understands what they're seeing, and they can learn something from it. So the size is being driven by attributes. On the right, we have uh, wind vectors. So this was some analytics that was done with uh, Wind Ninja. <coughs> we'll sort of move around. So each one of those little arrows is pointing to where the wind is blowing. And uh, the darker the color, the stronger the wind. So where it's semi-transparent, there's not much wind there at all. So a problem that you have, you have high wind, you need to watch out for adding in wind tunnels when you do these designs. But you also need to worry about these little um, little holes where there's not much wind coming through at all and they can get little hot spots, little heat islands that can appear in your city. So both of those things are important, both ends uh, of the design. And the number one cool thing about 3D views is that you get superpowers. You get to fly around. Everybody has a jetpack. 
You can use your, use your x-ray vision. You can see through things. Transparency works. Uh, you can expose invisible things. So we've got a, a, a shadow there being cast off from a building. There's no way to even conceptually see that in the real world, but you can create an object for it and represent it there uh, and show it. You can go underground like, and see everything you want. You can see using, uh, using radar. So LiDAR data, it's really big in 3D. They're just little tiny dots. They're returns from laser scans. You can use that. You have that power when you're in 3D. <coughs> and then uh, just to sort of show one in action, this is, um, this is the CBD in uh, Sydney. And we're just zooming in, see some content. We turn on our x-ray vision. So we can see that we've got floor information for all of this area here. You can see where people are. They actually have to, uh, in Sydney, they have to uh, say if there's any dangerous uh, storage items on any, of these, on any of these floors. So that's why we have all that information. But you can also show other things. So I'm going to hit pause. Got selective x-ray vision. So in this case, we're making the entire building uh, see-through, transparency. We're using our x-ray vision. And the things that are left there in green are the places that are available for lease. So if I'm looking to lease an entire floor, I can see my options. If I want north facing, south facing, east facing, I can see my options here. If I want to be above a certain floor, I can see all of that. In this case, we're just, just using a very simple technique of transparency, and selective transparency, and we can get a lot more information out of it we're using our superpowers. OK, so that's the end of the slides. Um, there's a couple at the end, just a sort of more of a handout thing that you can refer to later. Now we're going to get into some examples. So we're going to start with uh, JFK Interactive. So if you do a search for uh, JFK Interactive with a K, um, JF Interactive, sorry. This is, this is uh, Ken's. Oh, it's just a made up. It was just a word I thought of that had JFK in it, that's it. Yeah, it was a good one. Mm -hmm. I liked it. I just was, didn't want to misrepresent that. Was right. <laughs> so you can easily find this as public. Uh, and, and if you click on this guy, it opens up, up this web scene. So here we are, we're in a web page. So I've decided to, uh, well, we decided to, to deliver this as a, uh, an interactive web scene that people go around and explore. It's a complex thing to think about. And, the, and you can see the very first decision was we've got a local web scene. We've just got a small extent. We don't need to see the rest of the planet. We're just interested here. This is Dealey Plaza. And you can see I've got some bookmarks, so, so it's hard to get lost. I'm navigating around. I can go back to my overview. I can come down to where the car, the presidential uh, car entered. I can see I've got the names of the streets there as text. They're not really that big in real life, but I've made them big so you can read them. One little, uh, one little touch here is that the spacing between the cars is linked to time. So you've got a constant speed here, and then after the shots ring out, the cars get further apart because it starts to speed off. We can come down and look at key viewpoints, like where Oswald was. And see, I've done, we've done something a little bit interesting here. So there was three shots fired, and we've just used a, a, like a vertical line and a horizontal line together for the, for the uh, symbology for this uh, estimated shot direction. And now it looks like crosshairs. And so we'll sort of line them up, and you can see the three shots that were fired from there. So we're kind of using some um, real world <coughs> representation. If we come down, uh, in the interest of, of uh, taste, we've not tried to put a real person or a real model in here. We're using the, you know, sort of crash test dummy uh, model, but color coded so you know uh, who was who. <laughs> if you didn't it's know. the right pink on the pink dress. It, it is. It is the right pink, yeah. yeah. Ken made sure that it was the right colored pink. <laughs> um, so the magic bullet. Uh, in the, it was one of the theories was that it bounced around, and therefore there need to be multiple shooters, either back there on the Dell Tex building or a second shooter up there uh, in the book depository. So this is kind of showing this is the, is the Oswald shot, and these are the, the conspiracy theory uh, shots, if you like. If we come over here, you should be familiar with uh, the Zapruder video. Uh, so here, here's like an image showing the car coming around the corner. 
We can go to Zapruder 313, frame 313, which was the, uh, the, the head shot, the terrible shot, fatal shot. And then if we continue around, we can see car starts to speed off, Jackie's on the back there. So how do we do this trick? Well, we just took each of those frames and we sort of put them up in the air. And then by putting the, uh, the camera in the right spot, we can line everything up and see it all, all lined up. So pretend you're holding the camera and then the, the frame there is just sort of floating in space. So that's a technique that we'll, you'll see again later on, uh, just sort of a way to bring it in. If we go back up to uh, the overview, something else that added to, the, to a lot of the conspiracy theories was the sound direction. So where did people think the shots came from? So here's just like a representation of that. So 32% of people thought it came from the grassy knoll. 52% of people thought it came from the book depository. And 7% of people thought it came from both. 9% weren't sure. So this gives you an idea. Like if you look at this, sort of get a feel for, well, you know, a lot of people thought it came from the grassy knoll. It was not like just one or two people. It was sort of like a real consensus. So we're kind of bringing in some, some purely thematic uh, data. If we come down, you see we've also got these obvious, not real world things that are information points. So the umbrella man was there. Uh, reports of seeing blood pooling. So you can sort of go around and really investigate and click on all of these points and figure out what was happening. If we go over and look at the grassy knoll, this is the direction of the shot there. We can zoom out and we can sort of learn a bit more about why people might have thought the shot came from over here. And I think that's it. Was there anything else on about this that you wanted to talk about? It's cool, man. It's cool, man. Nice. Mm. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Do you wanna... I'll just, yep. So now we're going to go to the, the next demo. And it's going to be by Ken. Uh, I think what's nice about the JFK thing is, I mean, it's a ridiculously complex story. I mean, how many films have been made and, you know, all sorts of conspiracy theories. Um, and distilling that down into a simple scene, you couldn't really do that in a 2D map. And I'm sort of sat here as a bit of an imposter because I need a lot of encouragement to go into 3D um, because I need a really compelling reason or at least to experiment in it. And, and that, that was a good example, I think, of saying, well, how do you do that in 2D? And, and you get lost trying to even think of that. Um, 3D gives you the option. It also brings with it interactivity, which is a key component of the third dimension to give people the ability to, to move around. Right, this, um, this map, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that pretty much everybody in this room recognizes this map. Um, if you've had a Edward Tufty book or ever been to see one of his talks, um, this is what he bases his entire life on. Uh, that's, that's probably not quite true. But, um, you know, Tufty regards this as the best statistical diagram ever. Uh, I still call it a map because it's got spatial components in it. Uh, and I would agree with him on this particular uh, point. It's a fantastic representation of um, Napoleon's disastrous march to Moscow and eventual return with the decimation of 420,000 troops down to whatever it was, sort of 10, 15,000 at the end. Uh, probably less. Can't read that. Um, so I'm not going to talk about this because it's a session on 3D. That's blatantly a two-dimensional map. <laughs> you, you were getting nervous then. I did a little bit. You? I thought you were going to run with it. <coughs> <laughs> um, so I look at this map and it um, gives me a bit of inspiration. Can I make a three-dimensional version of this that um, adds something? Does the third dimension bring anything additional to representing this data um, to improve, <coughs> excuse me, improve on this diagram? Well, you start pretty much any 3D uh, map in 2D um, by just working with the data to, to get your basic structures, your basic shapes, and then you can play with it in 3D. The data I've got to work with is, is this. That's it. Um, so this is uh, the segments from the, um, the map by Charles Minard, and each of those segments has a um, number attached to it. This is the number of troops that um, were present on that particular segment. And then, of course, as you go through the segments, the number of troops diminishes. So this is my data. So the other thing I had was the latitude and longitude of the start and the end points 
of each of the segments in the uh, Maynard map, which are those. So I simply just had those lat longs, put them into ArcMap, and started working from there. Remember, I want linear features. I don't. The points aren't much help to me at the moment. So have we got a whale song going on? Is that just me listening? It's the neighbours. <laughs> just a little whale going by. Um, so I use the XY to line tool to generate uh, linear features between these points. XY to line tool specifying um, a start lat long and an end lat long. And you end up with a, uh, a diagram or a map. Well, that doesn't look, look much like the map to start with. So just to show you the build up of the 2D version, lots of segments symbolized with different width now to, um, to replicate the map. The interesting thing is uh, that I learned in doing this is the, that Minard actually exaggerated his line quite considerably at the start in relation to the, to the end. Um, but he also thickened the end because actually when you do it proportionally, there are even fewer troops return. So it was kind of interesting to see that even in that diagram there was a lot of um, generalization going on, 2D cartography. Anyway, it's not 2D, let's get away from it. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to mess around playing with color, I had to simplify the line segments, I then had to do a little bit of manual editing to move the end points to make sure um, the map um, built up, and in the end I created a, a 2D map. So for me, um, the start of this 3D project was to replicate the 2D project. That's my starting point. And then how do I go about doing something in 3D from that? So we then flip... <coughs> 11 tech workshops, sorry. Um, we then flip into 3D, and it's exactly the same data, and you can see here I've got that map I've just generated. Um, I've just effectively taken a, a screen grab of that and georeferenced it, um, and I've got a little bit of satellite imagery underneath it. Um, if I flip it on its side, I'm going to use that as a, as a local scene, a little bit of ground. Um, again, like the JFK, I don't need the rest of the world. So how do I go about building the, um, the map in 3D? Remember, I've got those segments, and they've got start lat longs, and they've got end lat longs. Well, if I presume that at those points, the value of troops changes, then I'm going to use that information as something that drives my, um, my Z height. Um, I'm not using elevation here. I'm using an attribute in the data itself. So I'm using a thematic piece of information that I'm going to encode in the Z dimension, Z dimension. So I used the um, feature to 3D by attribute tool, feature to 3D <coughs> by attribute. And I can say, I want to, you to take this line segment and I want you to use a <coughs> start elevation of this value and an end elevation of this value. But remember, I'm not using elevation, I'm using troop numbers. And so that creates lines that go from the planimetric to give them a, a three-dimensional um, orientation. So they're effectively going to go down a slope or up a slope, depending on whether the values increase or decrease. Now, of course, you know, if you're taking 420,000 troops, then they're never going to go up. They're all, the slopes are always going to go down. And I actually built this map um, from the ground up, and then Nathan had a genius idea, and this tends to be what happened. He'll come by my office, and say, what are you working on? And I'll go, this is great, what do you think? And he'll go, yeah, it's okay. Um, <laughs> what about doing this? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, great idea. That's why you're the 3D guy. And so I am now going to show you Nathan's idea of using, using the ground as a middle point, a middle layer, rather than at the base. So here's my group one troops. And you can see that they're now sloping lines, but they're not actually lines, they're tubes. So I'm symbolizing the line segments with a 3D shape, a tube, and they're hollow. I'll deal with that in a minute. But we're using the above ground layer to show the advance to Moscow. And the clever thing was then to use the below ground to show the retreat. I had it with the ground down here, just as a reference, but it works beautifully in the middle of the diagram instead. Um, okay, so you can see that we've got a little bit of a tube problem here. Um, and in the same way as that I had to edit the 2D data, I need to do something at the ends here. I've got those points, remember? 
and I can use those as vertices. I can change the base height in the scene of those points, those vertices, um, to the same height as the number of troops at that point. And I'm then going to symbolize them with the same width of the tube at that point. And what that has the effect of doing is just filling in my holes in my three-dimensional tube. It's pretty much a water slide, really. And so I've got a, I've got a nice sort of um, 3D thematic proportional line emerging here. OK, let's just fill the rest in just for the sake of time. And I'm going to show you a few other things. These grey vertical segments, these are points in the march where um, the troops were stationary in that particular place. And uh, they're going to become important in the story in a moment, but let's finish off the, th the whole thing. Um, we turn the whole thing into a multi-patch, which is a much more efficient way of eventually getting that onto the web inside a web scene. And we then add some cities on, which are just little squares with a bit of an extrusion. And I wanted to actually have leader lines going vertical to anchor my uh, huge water slide to certain cities to, so that we can, we can tell where we're at in the story. I then had um, temperature. Temperature is important because temperature was part of the um, part of the story. Oops, mouse control. You can just see I used 3D um, label marker symbols to put some temperature numbers down here. I actually put the temperature on the map itself. Okay, what about time slices? Well, these are just um, polygons for the, the extent of the area that I'm mapping. Um, we might be able to see if you go in there. There's just a little bit of an, uh, a wall effect, sort of an extrusion on the line just to create a wall uh, to have a 3D feature. And these are demarcating months in the march. We need labels for those. So we can put some labels on and turn the orientation so they sit flat to the diagram. So I've now got a 3D diagram, a 3D map um, of the, the Minard map. Um, and um, let's go, did I put it in there? Let's not, just for the sake of time. Um, we can put that into a local scene and do exactly what we had for um, the JFK and click on each of these tube sections and that reveals the actual number of troops. So is it, is it an improvement on the original? Well, possibly not. It hasn't maybe got the same elegance as that original, but it does offer us some important additional benefits. We now get an absolutely clear sense of what happened in these stationary periods. And in fact, a lot of troops who died because of the freezing temperatures and crossing the Berezina River down here. You can imagine if uh, Napoleon had just turned round as soon as he got to Moscow, um, you're not going to get into the harshness, as a harshness of winter at all. You're actually going to get most of your troops back before the harsh winter um, actually takes place. Um, so it gives that as an additional variable that allows people to see something different. And of course, you can spin it. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool, man. Um, <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't for one moment claim it's better than the original, but it does show you that 3D can offer you an additional perspective on data that you think perhaps has been mapped a million ways before. So this is a space-time cube. It's not a new concept, but the Minard map within it um, works reasonably well. And while I was sitting here, I was thinking, so we, 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 the grey vertical, we see where the, the army's not moving, as Ken was saying, that's an important part, the funnel of death that goes through Moscow, I call this. Um, the other thing I just thought of is that the slope represents how fast the troops were moving as well. Yeah, you're right. So we've got two extra things. Menard plus two, mate. That's good stuff. <laughs> cool. That's cool. And useful and educational. You're right, they did. They start, look at that, they started off slower. Yeah, same. And then they got a little bit quicker. What about the end? They got tired. Yeah, they got tired. All right. Um, so on to the next, next demo. Um, so we just did uh, Menard. Now we're going to do uh, Typhoon. So we've done a crime scene. We've done Death by March. Now we're going to do Typhoon. Real theme going on here. Uh, so here is some, some data for Typhoon Nabi 2005 and uh, just being displayed as push pins. I click on one, see we've got some information, wind speed, pressure, some links and so on. Um, this, is a, this is a really kind of bad way to show the content. I, I see where they went, uh, where the 
typhoon path went, and that's it. Uh, I can make it a little bit better if we're going to use those extruded points. So I've done them uh, with the cylinders, and that's a little bit better there. The height of each of those cylinders shows uh, the wind speed. So I'm learning a little bit more, see where the wind's, wind's picking up. But with this one, I really wanted to sort of challenge the system and see how much information we could add. And I came up with this one. So if we just work quickly through this, uh, we've got these, these things marching over the planet. So we can see where they went. So we've got X and Y. That's, uh, that's two things. Um, we've got, the, we can see the relative speed. So the same way we did the cars with regular speed in the JFK scene, these are 12 hours apart. So we can sort of see where it was going a little slower and then how it picked up speed as it went away past, uh, past Japan. So we're getting the speed, so that's three. Then I was thinking about the barometric pressure. And what's a good way to show barometric pressure? Well, pressure tubes seem pretty cool to me. So this is one of those sort of human understandable uh, symbols. So we see the dropping pressure. And I've got these little reference guides here on the side. And these are just extruded. So we extrude up, and then we fill in the rest with a different symbol. Uh, you can see here we've got lots of different layers that participate to make this. So each one of those layers sort of works together. So that's four. Uh, wind speed, the size of these disks is how much the wind speed is. So you can see how wind speed increases as the barometric pressure drops. We've got the wind direction, the shape of the symbol itself shows the direction that it's spinning in. Uh, if I zoom in, we've got some scale dependent or distance dependent rendering. So now we can see a bit more information. This is the date. This is the knots, this is hectopascals. We can see that's midday and midnight. Remember, this is every 12 hours. So we're getting, uh, getting the time uh, and the date. And if I click on these guys, we can turn some of that you know, bad sort of pop-up information that's usually just textual and actually show images as that's going around. So all up, there's eight parameters. There's X, Y speed, barometric pressure, wind speed, wind direction, time, and date, all available on here uh, using just some simple techniques. That's it for this one. That's cool, man. That's cool, man. How many variables did you have on that? That was eight. That's more than the Minard map. I think it is. 3D gives you the ability to put more on your map. Uh, OK, so the... Uh, I did this in a 3D stats session, uh, in a stats session earlier, but um, it works great in a 3D session. So um, here's the map of the 2012 uh, presidential election going from a strong blue to a strong red with purples in the middle. And um, here it is in 3D in um, arc scene. Now what I'm going to do just before we, to explain a particular principle, is change the view settings here. So you remember we talked about, uh, or Nathan said at the start, this difference between perspective and isometric. Well, we see the world in stereo, which is why I see the guys on the front row as about five times higher, bigger than the, in height than the guys on the back row. Um, and my brain can interpret that this probably isn't the case, and that it's just perspective telling me that these guys are bigger than the guys on the back row. Um, but when we're dealing with abstract objects, um, it becomes difficult. What are we actually looking at? Well, you know, we've got prism height here, and um, you know, we can tell that something's bigger than something else, but how much bigger? Well, if I move this onto its side and have a look at this county in Florida, um, at the moment it's sort of, what, I don't know, three, four times bigger than this um, prism of a county over in the northwest. Is it? Is it really? Well, if the point of the map is to try to get people to understand what the real differences are between places across the map, sometimes perspective doesn't do that job very well. Um, so how do we accommodate that? Well, in Arc Scene, you can just play around with the view angle settings, and actually changing it to one gives us that um, isometric map effect. A little disorientating, because it's not the natural way we view in 3D. What we've done here, though, is created a 3D projection where the scale is equivalent across the entire map. So the scale and the size here is exactly the same as the scale and the size here. So when we flick it on its side, now we can see that in fact, zoom in a bit, this Floridian County is, is just a little bit more than um, the northwest one. And if I switch the map around, do it from the other direction, 
there we are. You can see that this is still the same, slightly smaller than the one in Florida. So if the point of your map is to support real comparative um, assessment, then considering switching it into something like an isometric can work. Is the angle supposed to be 1 or 11? It's supposed to be 1. It's going to be even better now. 11 is nearly there, right? There you go. Okay, thank you for that. They're sharp still, aren't they? They're paying hey? attention. Thursday afternoon, still sharp. Um, so we can publish that straight into a, a, we a web scene just using one of the um, tools in Arc Scene. Pretty simple tool in uh, the City Engine toolbox, export to 3D web scene. And then when you go uh, online uh, into your um, account, you just add it as an item and it pops in as a, a 3D web scene. So this is the same map. Um, isometric as a local scene. Um, it's a big local scene, but it's, uh, it's in a, a web scene viewer. And we can flip it up to have a look at it in 3D and mess around with it and zoom in and do all that lovely stuff and still have clickety-click things, which tells us exactly what the number of votes were for each of these prisms across the map. So, again, interactivity is key. And we also find that, of course, in a 3D environment, typically uh, occlusion is a big problem. So here, you can't see what's going on behind the scene, but, of course, because it's interactive, you know, your map user can go behind and see exactly what's behind the scene. So all the typical problems for 3D cartography when you just show something as a static kind of start to diminish uh, when you're working in 3D. Um, the other cool thing just about the, um, this particular web scene is you can change what you're looking at to different layers in your, um, your scene. Perhaps use something like the swipe toolbar and we can now start to compare two 3D maps uh, side by side in the same viewer and do crazy stuff as well. And as one thing rotates, the other thing rotates. There you go. Um, now, we never normally, just before I finish this one, we never normally show you what not to do. Um, <laughs> Nathan might shout at me for this. I'm kind of on the, the edge of, of this. This is the, the global view of the same data. And the, it sort of accentuates a lot of the problems that you get with seeing things in perspective. Um, you know, for instance, even if you sort of want to assess Florida to the northwest, well, it's gone completely. You can't even compare it. Um, how do you assess the relative size of one prism to the other when we've got them all at funny angles? Don't know. Um, and of course, if you do something like, oh, here we go, mouse control, try to look at it from above, then actually the center of your map is almost being seen in plan view, whereas the extremities, because of the curved nature of the surface, are being seen in, in a prism. Um, it's cool, man. No doubt about it. But depending on what your uh, cartographic objective is, um, you might just reel yourself in a little bit um, and perhaps not go completely down this route. Uh, the extreme of this is every single country in the world extruded. I've seen those. They're, yeah, they're bad. Don't do those. <laughs> cool. Well That's done. me. Well done. Next. Yep. Go on. So the one thing that I have done that's pretty cool, uh, to use the word, uh, is I've extruded the country through the planet and out the other side. Oh, that is cool. That is, that is. Can you going to show you that? I'm not. Let's go yeah. on script. I'll do it. I don't have it with me. Oh, I do. Do you? Yeah, I you do. Have that one? If you can bring it up by next you, time, you can show it. But you have to give me credit. That's really important. All right. They won't know it's yours or mine. Well, that's a good point. All right, moving on. <laughs> uh, so uh, we've done the typhoons, we've done Obama. Now we're on to Chicago narcotics. Yeah, I know. I don't know what death to say. Death and drugs. It's death, drugs, war. Um, okay. So there are there are some tools in the GIS package uh, that create space time cubes. They're actually, uh, so crime changes uh, all the time. You need to, you have these points, and you can run analytics that create these these uh, results where you can see at a moment in time where the hot spots are. Uh, and it's kind of hard to understand what you're looking at at the end. But in 3D, if you use Z for time, so same way that in Menard you had the you know, time was changing through Z, we've got that same thing here. We use a similar effect with this is 2009 and then the end of the year, 2010, 2011, and, uh, and we sort of get a feel for it here. And then here's all those results. These are all the hotspots. 
See, there's a lot of them. There's two, two giant columns, basically. And if I zoom in, you'll see it looks like they're shrinking or running away from me. And what we have here is real world size symbols. So if you keep your eye on this guy right there, and I zoom away, there he's right in the middle, he's saying the same size in screen size, but then he gets swallowed up by all the other guys because everybody's keeping using the same number of pixels regardless of how far they are away from me. So this is screen space or screen size symbols. And it's useful for you know, finding things no matter how far away they are. So they're really good for push pins and stuff like that, locations. And they're okay-ish to, to, for this, whether everything will fill in. But then as soon as you zoom in, it kind of gets a bit disorienting. What's, you know, I'm in the matrix and it's freaking me out. Um, so, then, so there's a time and place for it. So let's, let's try that same data with a different symbology. So this is, now you can see also spaces between them. But if we zoom in, you can see that they're stacked. They're actual blocks that have a real size. I could measure this. I could put the measure tool on them. And they're a real thing. They're a car or you know, a real size thing. And we've got them so they stack up and touch each other perfectly. And if we look from above, um, it's it also quite nice because then we can look down and see roughly where, where these columns represent. But even this is not, and, but from a distance, it's kind of a bit ugly and a bit hard to see what's going on. So the next level is to do the same technique where it's real world size, but instead of cubes, they're sort of flattened cubes. And this actually represents the XY uh, area that this uh, data point represents. And then the Z is just this kind of representative time thing. So now we've got the best of both worlds. It kind of doesn't reshape. And we can look from the side and really notice that this is like a snowman. It's like, OK, why is, there a, why is it snowman? Or well, then if you come around here and you look at the temporal, you see that that lines up with the change of the year. So January, February, December sort of thing. This is Chicago. Less crime in January and February. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, that makes total sense. And you see here, there's a core. Uh, area of crime, and then they spread out more in summer, and they shrink back down, stay home, and stay warm in winter. So we've learned something already just by, by representing this in an interesting way. Uh, but there's, now we've got an occlusion problem. There could be a hole in the middle. The center of this column could be perfectly safe and a fantastic place to live, but we can't tell because it's surrounded by this shell. We can't see through them. So there's actually a good argument to be made that an interactive 3D view is not a good way to share this information. So in, this, in the PowerPoint that you've seen so far, there's been screenshots and there's been videos and we've been showing some live 3D views. They're kind of like the three levels or three different ways of sharing 3D content. Screenshots, if you're careful that you're not lying with perspective, not lying with uh, other, you know, occlusion, Screenshots are perfectly valid, or two or three screenshots, perfectly valid way of sharing some 3D information with others. Video is another way, and then the interactive one is one we've been showing the most of. In this case, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say that the video is probably the best way. So here's the video. We're at the very start of it. Um, this is one week. Each one of these slices is one week of crime, and uh, it's color-coded based on how hot or how intense that hot spot of crime is. Uh, we've got the, over here on the, the right-hand side, you'll see that it's early in 2009. I'm just going to hit play. So this is like the heartbeat of crime for, for Chicago. It's like boom, 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 boom. Each one of those turning on is a week. And you can sort of see it heats up in the middle, spreads out, uh, and you can see how much it spreads out. And then we get close to the end of the year, and yep, sure enough, it sort of shrinks in. Everybody's staying home. And then, oh, it's beautiful weather. Let's go out and drive our cars around and do some more crime. And, uh, <laughs> but you can see there's no holes. So now we're seeing something. Yeah, exactly. Nice. <coughs> Where was that last time? I didn't think of it last time. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can stop the sound effect now. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, the patient's now dead. Uh, so here's the trick. How did we do that? Well, we we're just moving the camera up in time. As each week turned on, everything was put on uh, sort of on in time. And then we had the little uh, aerial map come up in time with it. So it's just a visual trick. And now we come down and we see the snowballs. And sure enough, January, February, that's, that's where it's uh, a little safer. Uh, so you can put overlays on. When you do videos, you can add extra things. You can do audios, and you can add in uh, screenshots. And in this case, you can even change what data. So this is the worst spots. And you can see that the, if we go back a smidge, because this is the good news for Chicago. Um, 
the si you can see the size of these are shrinking. That shows that they are making progress in re reducing these hotspots through the years. So we're learning stuff by seeing it in, in 3D. All right. What was the, just before you switch over, what was oh. the name of your, through the, through the earth, what, do you remember what you named me? I don't remember. All right, let's not do it, I can't find it. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's that, that demo, on to the next one. Hexagon, hexagon? Yep, made Mapping. of wood. JF can interact, Helix, whatever. Um, Over to Ken. So um, I, I became uh, fascinated with cartograms through the use of uh, cartograms in British politics and the reporting of election results. We've been using them for years and years and years and years. <coughs> and I knew they were going to be used again for the May elections that have just passed. And I thought, well, I want to do something a little bit different. And I set myself a bit of a challenge because I wanted to construct a three-dimensional cartogram of the UK election results. And now it ended up being quite a challenge. But um, let me show you the sort of start of the process and how I got to the the end bit. First of all, I needed a discrete global grid of hexagons to wrap beautifully around the planet. And computationally, that's not an easy thing to actually construct. Because remember, we're working now with a curved or spherical surface. We're not just taking a, um, <coughs> excuse me, taking a projected uh, piece of information that we've got already in a planimetric um, state and then wrapping it around the globe. I, I don't have these shapes, okay? You can't just take what look like real hexagons and project them onto a spherical surface because they won't look like hexagons when they're on that surface. So I needed something to generate what you're looking at, which are equal sized hexagons, but which are in projected in Mercator at the moment on the screen. Um, now, fortunately, there's a clever guy at University of Oregon called Kevin Saar, uh, computer scientist, who's generated a little um, command line tool, um, nothing to do with, with Esri products, but um, open source, and I got in touch with him and said, do you mind me using this? Can I? Great, he said, go ahead. So um, that took me a little while to generate the results, but I created a load of um, discrete global grids of hexagons in lots of different sizes. Lots of different sizes. Pretty, isn't it? Should we just leave it there? Yeah. Um, so, no. yes. <laughs> <coughs> um, now, to save you going to the effort, if you want a discrete global grid in, grid in hexagons of different uh, resolutions, all of these are online in artjoes.com for you to download and play with if you, if you want to. Anyway, why did I do that? Uh, because if I go to the geography of the UK, and zoom to layer, there are the 650 constituencies. Uh, Ireland, or the Republic of Ireland, is not part of this political process, so that's why it's missing. Uh, 650 political um, constituencies, but I wanted them as hexagons and as a cartogram, so I turned 650 constituencies into 650 equal area shapes. And I did that by creating a fine mesh using Kevin Saar's tool. Um, it looks slightly odd, okay, in 2D. It's not going to be used in 2D, that's the point. We're turning it into 3D in a moment. And I then sort of clipped the shape out to get my United Kingdom and, and with Ireland. And actually I had to do a little bit of manual processing because I wanted 650 polygons, but there are way fewer in Scotland than there are in England. So I ended up with that as my shape. That's my cartogram in 2D. Um, I then made some buffers according to the political results, and I'll show you why I did those later, but some internal buffers um, that I'm going to use later for a different thing. So I then, in the beauty of Pro, I might just go to online and show this. Beauty of Pro is you can then take your 2D data from a, a one view and put it into a local or a global scene. And that allowed me to create extruded surfaces from those base hexagons. Uh, you're not going to play, are you? No, oh, there they are. A little bit slow. So these are just extruded um, polygons. We've got some baked-in colours and a few other little tricks in there to get over some of the... Um, 
or to, to embed some of the symbology that I wanted. But I'm, just for the sake of time, I'm going to get out of Pro. And then you publish from Pro straight into, um, well, I, I would say ArcGIS Online, but at the moment it's a portal that supports some of the symbology choices I particularly made. And I'll be totally open. This is a sort of a prototype map that's on a, uh, um, a development portal. It's on a 10.4 portal. So what I've got is um, some extruded symbols for each of the layers of the election results with base heights modified to make them sort of sit on top of the various geographies. Um, one of my, my sort of issues with 3D cartography where we're dealing with polygons is the inability to see inside uh, po polygons when you've got layers sat on the top of other layers. Now Nathan showed a great way of actually revealing some of that for the narcotic stuff. But here I've organized my uh, cartography so that I can strip away the winner layer and have a look at who the runners up were, and the political affiliations. Um, and then I can strip the runners up away so I see who were third place. And this reveals an interesting cartography that this um, party that um, has purple as their color actually really rose to prominence in the elections. Not enough to win much, but third place is a pretty good, um, pretty good go when there are about 13 or 14 different parties. And then all of the other losers. Look at them. <laughs> so these are extruded by total votes and colored by party affiliate affiliations or the party colors. And you, you'll see now it, it's not just a straight red blue. Um, we've got a, a lot of variation. And of course the interesting thing is how England varies from Scotland. Let's go over to Scotland. Um, here the Scottish National Party um, came to prominence as winners and they moved all these Labour Reds into second place. And then if we go to, to Ireland, um, we've got a, a sort of a, an impression here of a very different geography altogether. I can put some labels on and this the leader lines, I attributed some pop-ups to those or added some pop-ups to give you access to the actual results. And if I start moving around the map, you'll see that the labels progressively reveal uh, or what's the opposite of reveal? Hide. Disappear, hide. Um, which is a really nice way, way to apply some um, on-the-fly cartographic generalization. You don't want 650 labels on the map um, or at every scale, so it progressively um, modifies this. I added a little legend, and let's, just, let's go to the legend. Come on. To show the total number of parliamentary seats each party won using the same hexagonal um, uh, blah, blah, shape. And uh, the pop-up here says something about the map, but I also put in the pop-up just a little graphic that I built in, in Illustrator um, to show um, what the um, hexagonal stuff um, actually says. The very final point about this, what are those funny shapes that I made the polygons of? Well, these are capstones. Again, if I wanted to look at this map from above, uh, I'm getting occluded data from the polygons. So I created these shapes to give a almost a proportional colored symbol type appearance to what we're seeing inside the hexagons, if you're viewing this from above. The map's on a custom hexagonal base map using the same Kevin Saar um, approach. Why hexagons? Well, hexagons are great, uh, but I also was uh, interested in a map, not a map, a picture that of our Prime Minister walking the Giant's Causeway, and I thought, ha-ha, that'll do for me. That's a great little metaphor. So I ran with that, uh, and that's, that's the map. Um, so coming, I think, is the word to say with that one. You'll be able to do that soon. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> there were some technical challenges, good debugging. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the things that we do make in these maps internally support development. They're not just maps that we sit down and go, I'm going to make a nice 3D map of politics today. You know, they have a, a function. But anyway, we thought we'd let you have a look at it. Thanks, Ken. Uh, so uh, the next one is views of Mount Fuji. Uh, this might look familiar a little bit, but let me uh, quickly bring it up. So. I don't know if anyone's seen this, this painting. Um, it's very famous. It's, part, it's actually part of a series. So it's got Mount Fuji off in the distance. And it's, there's 36 different paintings, uh, all with Mount Fuji in them. And uh, I was challenged by a co-worker, not Ken, which was interesting, uh, to um, find out where these were. And I thought, that sounds pretty cool. So here's the result. So I've done it. Um, and if we, uh, if we click on this guy right here, 
This is a, so luckily there's some information about it. It's not just painting one. It's called the Great Wave of Kanagawa. And this is Kanagawa here. So we're off, off the uh, Kanagawa there. And the size of this gave me a hint that it was about 12 kilometers uh, off the coast. So I placed it there. And then I gave myself a B minus. So all of these are rated. So if we look at this guy up here, uh, I gave myself an A minus here. Uh, so this is Lake Sua. So I found the actual uh, lake. I found a little promontory that looked pretty good. Uh, so then I placed it and I gave myself an A minus. Uh, so how did, how did I do that? It seems kind of a little bit random, but there's a bit more to it than that. So we'll come down. So here we are in 3D. Uh, and here are all those lines. And uh, you can see just how big and how prominent Mount Fuji is. All the lines are leading there. And here's that painting. And this is a billboarded symbol. So no matter where I go, it's always facing towards me. You also notice that it's semi-transparent, so I can see through it. And then if a little, you know, a little teaser, I can sort of spin it around. You can see that, the, that it matches up there. So a key point to this, uh, having this content work, is having bookmarks. So we'll come forward to a key viewing location, and you can see that that lines up. So we'll go back there. We'll line it up. That. Did you hear that? He said, that's cool. The good man. Good man who said that. And these well, guys down here. Yeah, they can come back. Uh, so that's, that's one. So what about the others? So we can come over and, and have a look at some of the other ones. We'll just zoom over. So this one's really close. So we need to be pretty close to the mountain to do it. And there's 36 of them. So rather than run through all 36, I'm just going to show you a couple of my favorites. Uh, we'll go to number 12. Well, actually, while we're getting there, I will point out one thing. So uh, here's, here's Mount Fuji. All of these ones over here, this is Tokyo. So you can see a lot of them are in Tokyo. But he actually did a pretty good job uh, either traveling, we don't know, traveling there or, uh, or um, imagining himself in the, in the correct locations. Uh, so here we are back, and we're already at the viewpoint. Let's see how that lines up up there. Uh, so let's have a look at the information. This, this, the name of this is very helpful. Sunset over the Ryogoku Bridge from the bank of the Sumida River. Okay, so this is the Sumida River. That wasn't too hard to find, but you can imagine I was pretty pleased when I found Ryogoku Bridge. And I thought, cool, there's the bridge. It still exists. It's on the left-hand side because Fuji's over there. And then you just sort of move around until you get yourself lined up. And when everything's good, you create your screenshot. Uh, and then I'll just show you one more. And this is purely because it reminds me of Dr. Seuss, and everybody loves Dr. Seuss. So first of all, does everybody agree that that looks like Dr. Seuss? <laughs> Hundred and something years beforehand. Uh, and again, um, so looking from above, it's on a little promontory. I could have picked a couple of these spots here. I've picked this one. Um, I gave myself an A- minus for this one. Uh, and then we come down. I'm a pretty tough critic. And you can see you can just sort of line it up. I actually have the bookmark a bit better lined up. But that's how it all works. Anything else I want to talk about? Nope. Now I'm going to pass you back to Ken. That's cool, man. That's cool. I really like that. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, right, let's just fin finish with, um, uh, well, certainly the demo bit with a little bit of um, silliness. Because um, that's what I'm good at. So I wanted to mess around with some Lego. So let's build some 3D Lego. Uh, this is a map of the US. Uh, this is the use of a fishnet tool to create a regular grid of polygons for the entire country. Uh, this is then dissolved um, to create uh, the states. And then this is then color coded according to, according to the Pantone colors of, the, uh, uh, of Lego that you find online and using a four color theorem tool to actually make sure we only need four colors across the map without any neighboring states having the same color. Anyway, but then Lego's got little knobbly bits. So I did a point, um, a featured point for each of the polygons, generated some points, symbolized those with little circles. Why are you spinning? Come back. And added a little bit of annotation to generate, woo, generate a label in Lego symbology. And then I decided that I needed a play mat. So I created a little rectangle. Oh, and let me just do a zoom to layer. This is getting crazy. And then I created some novels on the play mat. So I've got a play mat with novels on there. Title plinth, plinth outline. 
And I located Lego stores with just points. This is, this is real geography. I then created a store density surface with a GP tool, because this is real analysis. Um, so I now have a, a nice density surface of uh, the geography of Lego store, um, Lego stores in uh, the US. And just for the heck of it, I put some fun stuff points on, randomly positioned, which I'll show you in a minute. And I ended up with uh, the final base map, or the map that looked like that, United States of Lego. Now that's 2D. Um, I'm not going to show you in Arc Scene, but I then literally took that data, put it into Arc Scene, and just spent a little bit of time extruding all of these different square polygons and uh, to build the final, um, final map. And then I published it out as a local view into, um, uh, into um, my organizational account as a web scene. So here's the play map. Oh, it's Lego. So these are all those tiny little nodule things just with a bit of extrusion. And of course we need to stick some bricks on that Lego. So let's stick the base map on. And there's our little Lego bricks. There you go. What do you do for a job, son? I play with Lego. Ah, <laughs> oh, good. Okay, so now let's, let's play with the density surface and put that on. Uh, again, extrusion and conversion to a multi-patch in this case. So now we can see the peaks of Lego stores over on the west coast and the northeast. Uh, very little through the middle. And Alaska, they just need Amazon drones to get their um, Lego to them. Uh, great, okay. So remember those points, um, all the Lego stores, um, they're now 3D lightsabers in the scene. Because I found a 3D lightsaber model uh, online. And when I mean a model, I mean a 3D collada model or a, a, some other um, model that we can use um, to replace our just simple points within Arc Scene. And if you go into an edit session, you can select the point and say replace with model, and it'll replace it with the model that you've got um, on your hard drive. So that's lightsabers. And then the fun stuff, well, you've got, oh no, they're too big. The fun stuff, oh, come back. There we go. The fun stuff is, is just adding in um, more models. <laughs> just to. I should do my Yoda impression. No, let's not do that. Uh, so there we've, got, there we've got some fun stuff. Um, the, you know, the point of showing you this is you can replace simple points with complex models. Um, in this case, you know, it's Lego versions of, uh, of Millennium Falcons and uh, TIE Fighters and X-Wings and that. And um, I've got Darth Vader in here somewhere. There he is. You can see the back of him. Uh, you know, Vader's in there. Uh, I couldn't find a Princess Leia in a golden bikini, but, um, you know. Do you have that 3D model? I've almost got it. Okay, cool. Good, good stalling for time. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Are you just building that? I am. Live? Yeah. Oh, cool. How, how long do you want it? Uh, not long. I'm almost okay. there. Uh, so, all right, let me let, tell you a little story about this. So, this was... The real reason to, to build this was that I actually wanted to initially create a 2D map um, for some... Uh, to, to portray some pictures that a guy, Jeff Friesen, had done, all of these little dioramas of, um, you know, typical, stereotypical, I should say, scenes from various um, states. And, uh, well, I haven't finished now, I've just oh, started. sorry. Stop stalling. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, let's get to... Oh, I don't know where we are. Um, and I wanted this base map to support the theme. You know, it just wouldn't have looked right with the Esri's World Topographic base map and then, you know, where all these um, places are. So I used it to do this. And that's when I thought, I wonder whether I can do something in 3D. And I built this and, um, you know, it looks pretty cool. But the, I took it to the AAG and it was on the Esri booth and a, um, a mother and five-year-old um, son came by and the son was like, oh, look, Mom, Lego, let's, let's play with that. And she's like, no, this is serious GIS. Look, it's the Esri booth. And um, <laughs> she, said, she said, don't do that. I said, of course he can have a play with it. So up he got on his stool and he got the mouse and he sort of did this and then looked at it. 
It's like, you know, where are the lasers? How, well, how come I can't move the Millennium Falcon? I, I can't get the snow speeders to go across the terrain. It's rubbish, and he got down. So his interest was lost just like that. So even when you think something's cool, man, uh, it can be really uncool for <laughs> kids who are used to immersive, you know, gameplay and whatever. So I've got to gamify this. That's the next job. All right. Yeah? Yep, really quick. We are running a little bit late, but it's the last session of the day, so we can't be late now. Uh, so here we are in 3D. I just built this. In fact, I didn't even have the data, so I went online and I downloaded countries' polygons. Um, I added them, added them in. Uh, I set a definition query, so we've got China. Uh, so that's China, and I, I've kind of done something a little bit evil, but I've extruded it up here so we get a feel for that uh, there. And if I actually I change one more property here, my elevation surface, I'm going to allow myself to go underground. Uh, because it's, this this is going to freak you out a little bit. Um, oh, I'm on a, did I not say okay? Oh, let me go underground. Actually, I'll, I didn't hit okay properly. Allow navigation below ground. Hopefully, I just didn't discover a bug. But let's. Yes. Okay. So here I am below ground, and we're going to follow that red column down through the center of the planet. It gets really small in the middle, so it's coming down through the center of the planet, and then it's exploding out in the opposite direction. So does that sound, if that sounds weird, think about it this way. If we're thinking about digging through the planet, like Bugs Bunny, um, from, over, from a northerly part of here, we would expect to come out more south on the other side. So we're going to come through. And this is where you would dig from China. So if I was going <laughs> to dig through the center of China, I would be there. And uh, just because I, I just did a definition query, I did Australia. So there's Australia upside down up there. So that's where you get pretty wet digging out of Australia. Interestingly, it fits almost perfectly inverted. So I don't know what that says. Uh, so there you go. That was uh, one last little thing. Can I show them that? Bonus. You want to you, uh, now it's, show, it's, I want to show it's them like more. a fight. Well, I didn't man. do that, and you didn't do this, but this is one of our. Uh, colleagues, Richie Carmichael, I think, did most of this. It's all the satellites in the world. Uh, this is just beautiful, and they're all clickable, and you can sort of you know, see the constellation and how the satellite moves through space. What I like about this is the cartography, not just the above ground, but he's got the shadow of the orbits on the planet as well. Anyway, I just want to show you that. I like it. I like it too. Uh, so um, you can download the slides. Uh, we, we will upload all of this, and you can get them. And so this is just kind of like reference information. When you're authoring your 3D scenes, sort of what's your message, what's your delivery mechanism, canvas type, et cetera, and then you know, a couple more pages of things you can follow up. Uh, and of course, if you like the session, you can go to the app and, and give us a review. Uh, let us know anything more or less you want to see next time. Uh, and I can open up for questions. Anyone got any questions? No, thank you very much. <laughs>